Welcome, folks. This is Steve Adubato. This is, once again, the Leadership Hour with, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Mary Gamba. And Mary, could you share with everyone, if they're joining us for the first time on the Leadership Hour, what exactly are we doing? Oh, we are talking everything leadership, <laughs> but ironically, we get into so many different topics. We get into leadership, family, running meetings, facilitating presentations, life, life very deep into life history. We, we've had a few of our guests on the radio at uh, 2 p.m. on AM 970 on Sundays talking about history and the, how we can connect that to leadership. So it's been a really great time. Yeah, by the way, we had one of our friends, we actually going to be joined by Roger DeRose, who is, in fact, a great friend who's the president and CEO of Kessler Foundation. We had one of our colleagues, uh, one of our guests on the Leadership Hour recently say that he was most influenced by Helen Keller. Mm -hmm. and, we, and Mary and I looked at each other in the studio thinking, where is this going? Mm -hmm. And he said... It was all about her vision. And even though she could not see, she had a vision uh, for the future and a vision for how she could impact the world around her. So it was fascinating. Yeah, she was actually asked by someone, could you think of anything worse than losing your eyesight. And she said, uh, yeah, losing my vision. Mm -hmm. And that is in many ways connected to leadership. And by the way, speaking of where people can go as leaders of, I have no point I'm making right now. Mary, where can they, <laughs> I just want to get, have them go to our website. Tell them exactly. how to get there. Stand-deliver.com. Could they you can say it again, please? Stand-deliver.com. They can get information on your book, Lessons in Leadership. There are articles up there that are free of charge on every topic imaginable to leadership and communication. They can follow you on Twitter, Steve Adubato. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D., and they can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play and on iTunes, which is super exciting. Google Play and? iTunes. That is cool. And by the way, in the second half hour of the Leadership Hour, it is our program, State of Affairs, that we produce in cooperation with our friends at NJTV. It is a television program on NJTV, WNET, PBS stations, on Fios, on different platforms. But you also hear it right here on AM 970, The Answer. That's at 230 on Sundays, but that is the entire leadership hour. And you know, Mary, you know, you and I and our work together at Stand and Deliver and our work at our PBS production company get to meet some fascinating people. One of the one of the leaders we met a few years ago and have created a very strong bond with, a great relationship with, is a guy that is on the phone right now. He's our great friend Roger DeRose, president and chief executive officer of Kessler Foundation. How you doing, Roger? Hey, I'm good, Steve. Thank you. Mary, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you for joining us this Sunday afternoon. Do us a favor, Roger. For people who don't know what Kessler Foundation is, could you give them the Reader's Digest version? You bet, Steve. Yeah, so Kessler Foundation is a public charity, and we are uh, focused on disabilities in terms of helping individuals with disabilities in terms of from a research perspective the work that we do is to address many of the functional issues that people with brain injury and spinal cord injury and stroke and multiple sclerosis have and then in addition to that we are an employment grant maker so we give grants to organizations that help to create jobs for people with disabilities so we're very closely associated with kessler institute we are a freestanding organization but we do much of our research in coordination with Kessler Institute, and I think probably all of your listeners in this viewing area know about Kessler Institute. Absolutely true. And by the way, to fully disclose, uh, Kessler Foundation has been one of the underwriters of our public broadcasting programming, our Fios programming. And recently, I moderated a forum at Kessler Foundation that had... Uh, I mean, we did a lot on, on military folks, on veterans, uh, veterans who are trying to get back into the workplace, and, and many of whom have been injured and are dealing with incredibly challenging physical, emotional, psychological challenges. Uh, Roger, real quick on this. You and I, particularly you and your work, have met a whole range of veterans who are trying to make it back in society and lead meaningful lives. Have you learned anything about leadership from listening to them? Well, from everything that I've heard in terms of uh, working with the vets, you know, the great takeaway that I always take away from my discussions with vets is that they're very team-oriented. They are trained in the most difficult situations. They work, they respond to uh, almost any situation in a very positive way. They have a great work ethic. And so in the work that we do here at Kessler Foundation, we're working with vets that 
have cognition issues from brain injury or post-traumatic stress syndrome, or in one of the areas, Steve, as you know, Gulf War illness. And we also work with vets that have spinal cord injuries as well. Whether they sustained them in battle during their service or they had the injury post leaving their veteran life, Mm. they still are veterans and service members that we owe a great deal of gratitude to. That's uh, You're listening to Roger DeRose, president and CEO, Kessler Foundation. This is Steve Adubato. I'm here with my colleague, Mary Gamba. This is the Leadership Hour. Roger, let me ask you this. I've also done coaching, training, leadership development at Kessler Foundation. You've been doing it from day one. One of the themes that you and I have talked about over many enjoyable lunches and time off the air is your commitment to coaching, mentoring, and developing future leaders. Talk about, A, where that philosophy comes from, and B, how the heck do you execute it? Well, Steve, you know, I I grew up in the for-profit industry and uh, worked in that for about 30 years, and then before moving over to do something that had a social mission in the nonprofit public charity area. And I believe that my roots in succession development and coaching really goes back to my earliest days at S.C. Johnson, the family company based in Wisconsin, where I'm from. And at S.C. Johnson, being a family company, there was a great deal of emphasis on succession planning and how you coach and mentor the next generation of leaders. And so we had a very formal process that we used in terms of grooming the next level of leaders, whether they were high potential or growth potential or a key asset to the organization. And then everyone had a plan that was followed to assist those individuals in terms of meeting their potential within the organization in terms of growth. And what really comes down to, Steve, is if you're not going to grow those individuals in the organization, somebody is going to come along and pick them off. And so as a retention method, you want to be grooming people from within as much as possible. And that's something that we do here at Kessler Foundation. So I've taken that lesson that I learned at SC Johnson and have taken it with me wherever I've gone, whether it was at Arthur Anderson, where I went after SC Johnson, or into the social services of Kessler Foundation. Let me follow up. This is Steve Adubato uh, here with Mary Gamba. This is the Leadership Hour on AM 970, The Answer, every Sunday at 2 p.m. Roger DeRose is the uh, leader over at Kessler Foundation. Roger, but here's what I find interesting, one of the many things you're talking about. But don't you have to sometimes pick the quote-unquote high potential people, people who you think could be potential leaders. And frankly, Mary and I had a whole discussion. We may get into this again, the difference between, quote, doers, really good doers. They get things done versus the high potential leaders. Don't you have to identify some of these high potential leaders, invest in them, bring in people like me, other people who are even better at leadership and communication coaching? And not everyone gets the same coaching, the same investment of time and effort. And how the heck do you select those folks? But more importantly, Mary often says, treat people fairly, but not equally. They're not all the same, are they? No, you're right, Steve, and it's a really difficult task of a manager, of a leader, in terms of selecting who you're going to bet on the future. And everyone has different stepping stones at at different points in their career, and it's really identifying who those individuals are that you're going to bet on in terms of making those investments. And so as I look at the leadership programs that you've been leading for us, here in our organization, those are individuals that are handpicked by myself and with your input and with the management team's input to really try to identify the folks that have the greatest potential in terms of their communication skills, their decision-making ability, their relationship ability, the way they perform in terms of writing grants, in terms of their scientific backgrounds. And so, you know, you're going through an assessment of a range of different core competencies to say, these are the folks that I'm going to put my money on and bet on at this particular moment in time. And you can't do everyone at one time. So you pick the individuals that you think are your best bet at this moment in time in the history of the organization. Quick follow up. Mary, I'm going to do it. Roger, there's a Pandora's box I'm trying not to open here, but... Your organization, we have a 10-person organization, 
you have a much larger organization, complex organization, with, let's say, very highly educated people, talented, smart people. And there are also people in administrative roles who are talented and have different degrees or not or whatever. Do you believe that an organization can be truly great, Roger DeRose from Kessler Foundation, with not just great leaders and potential leaders, but also terrific doers who get the job done every day, but have no real leadership desire and or potential? You talk about who you're going to bet on, the future leaders, the potential stars. Do you believe that in your organization or in any great organization to be truly the best, you could have both leaders, potential leaders, and those who are not leaders, those who have no desire to be leaders, those who don't have the potential to be leaders, they're doers. They're just really great doers, but they're not leaders. Mary says, yes. I say, no. You say, well, I say that you need to have both. And in our organization, if you look at the 150 or so employees that we have here, you'll find that there are visionaries that are thinking about the future in terms of where we're going to be making the next great leap in terms of a medical intervention that we want to work on. And then, But at the same time, once you win a major federal grant from the NIH or the Department of Defense, you have to have a team under you that is going to help you execute that plan. And so while everyone is in a certain position playing a certain role, everyone has that role to execute. And so you do need the proper mix of individuals. And I'd say the other thing, too, Steve, is that individuals in our organization are coming into the organization at different points in their career. So while they may be a doer today, they may have certain skill sets that are going to be developed along the way that we will be looking for in order to grow them in the organization mm -hmm. as far as we can. So I think it's a mixture of both in terms of the way we have to operate today and get our work completed. So there you have it. Apparently, Mary, after because I respect Roger's opinion <laughs> so much, I've always said everyone has to be a leader or a potential leader. Mary says you need a mix. Roger DeRose, the CEO and the president of Kessler Foundation, who, uh, okay, so he agrees with Mary. Fine. I'm wrong. He embarrassed me right on the air. No, I'm only kidding. That could have gone either way, Roger. But I'm very appreciative that uh, you definitely agree with me. And, and I do. I feel that there is a fine balance between having those that are going to lead and that those that are going to execute. Because if follow. those and follow, if you have someone that's going to execute a plan and then in their mind as a leader, they're going to question what it is that they're doing. They're not just going to do it. And in some cases, you just need the people to execute and get the job done. So, Roger, anything else you'd like to add about leadership on the Leadership Hour? Apparently with Mary Gamba and Steve Adubato as her sidekick. Go ahead. Well, Steve, you know, I, I, we, we greatly appreciate all the work that we have done with you and uh, the awareness that you've helped to build for our organization here at Kessler Foundation. Um, you know, we're looking forward to having you come back and do your third year uh, leadership session with uh, – a small group, a group of about 12 individuals that uh, have asked for you to come back because they've enjoyed it so much. And, and so I know we have a, a great relationship with you, Steve, and with Mary and your organization, and we just look forward to continuing our, our joint work together with you. I swear that was not a commercial. That was Roger just totally unscripted. <laughs> but it was a good it was a good commercial. And Roger, you're a great partner, a great friend, and, and particularly for the purposes of this program a first-rate leader who invests time, effort, and tremendous personal energy on the development of others. And I, and I don't know if I've ever seen a CEO that committed. Roger, my friend, enjoy um, uh, the rest of this beautiful Sunday, and we will talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Roger. Okay, this is the Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba on AM 970, The Answer, or you're listening to us on a podcast uh, where? Absolutely, on iTunes or on Google Play. We'll be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources.
Welcome back to the Leadership Hour. This is Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba. We appreciate you joining us every Sunday at 2 p.m. in the second half hour at 2.30. Um, State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a program in which we um, interview leaders in state government, national government, leaders of all stripes uh, who are dealing with difficult challenges and problems. Mary, after listening to Roger DeRose from Kessler Foundation, in all candor, uh, so that people understand, his folks are scientists, researchers, brilliant, brilliant people who are trying to find new and different ways to help those who are struggling with some real physical challenges, cognitive challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, great work. But one of the things I have found, and I know this is the leadership hour, if you will, is that these leaders who have incredibly um, advanced degrees, in most cases PhDs, doctorates, in highly technical fields, folks can be challenged sometimes, and these his folks at Kessler happen to be great at this, but do you ever notice how people who have tremendous education or tra- and or training in a particular field as leaders have a very hard time translating that knowledge to other audiences to a degree that anyone will follow them, by the way, even understand them in the first place? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you're talking about those with a PhD and the doctors, we coach a lot of uh, doctors and physicians that are out there. By the way, let's clarify my PhD from Rutgers. Absolutely. Is in the field of? It is in the field of communication. So you are fully equipped and trained to coach (laughs) those uh, who can't uh, when it comes to communicating. Um, But yes, and it depends on, it's know your audience. So if you are a physician and you're speaking at a conference and it's all physicians, sure, you can use the technical language. You could talk about this approach or use that acronym. If you're talking to uh, just the lay person, a normal, or even more importantly, if you're talking to a family, say in a hospital setting, and you're trying to explain what's going on with their loved one, probably the most important person in their life, and you're using that technical jargon, you're not going to connect. You're not, you need to engage in a personal human way using everyday language that people can understand. And that's very difficult and challenging for doctors. Did I, have I ever talked about the scene in Patch Adams here? No, not on the radio. Okay. I know it well, but we have not talked okay. about it. So I remember early on when I started doing leadership and communication seminars, there's a scene, um, by the way, there's an amazing uh, documentary, I believe on HBO about Robin Williams right now. Uh, check it out. So Robin Williams was in Patch Adams. He was Patch Adams. There's a real Patch Adams. Um, our late great friend, Dr. Gold, um, knew Arnold Gold, knew um, Patch Adams, the Patch Adams. And the whole thing with Patch Adams, as people remember without breaking the movie down too much, is that he believed that physicians, beyond being clinically very talented, brain surgeons, et cetera, et cetera, do great surgery, they needed to connect with their patients on a human personal level, and that empathy and compassion was critical, all part of leadership, right? Absolutely. There's a scene in... Patch Adams, that I'll never forget, that I used to use in seminars, still do sometimes, in which Patch Adams is walking with the other group of uh, residents, mm-hmm. except he's not, I don't even think he's a legitimate res- resident because they all have white coats. His right. white coat comes from a a, um, a butcher company. Right. He just stole it and he's got his hand covering the, the, <laughs> the, the meat sign. Here's what I'm getting at. The leader, the the the, the head resident, uh, Brian, what do they call the the... The chief, re- the chief, whatever the heck. Resident? The head resident? Or the head, the- this was the chief doctor, okay, chief physician. And he's taking them on rounds. And they meet this woman who's laying on a gurney. And she is clearly frightened and she's sick. And the lead doctor has 15 residents around him. And he takes the, uh, the, the, the covering off her and, and shows her foot. And he, he says this. Here we have a case, 201, of a woman in her 50s, gangrene, clearly serious, and he start, and he says, could be a case of mastioyelitis, potential amputation. Any questions? And I'm, uh, this is the video I show. And Robin Williams is sitting there, and of course none of the other residents have any questions. They do a f- close-up of the woman's face. Who's terrified at that point, by the way? She's freaking out. They're talking about her as if she's not even there. Osteomyelitis, 
possible amputation. Any questions? And you ever see the scene where Patch Adams, in, in this case, oh, yeah. uh, Robin Williams says, uh, yes, I have a question. What's her name? And the surgeon says, what? And he says, what's her name? And he looks at the chart and he says, uh, now I'm forgetting the name, um, Edith. And, and Patch Adams says, uh, Edith, how you doing? And he holds her hand. She says, I'm okay. And she smiles and a tear comes to her eye. What does this, any of this have to do with leadership and empathy and compassion and someone being really smart clinically or otherwise, but not really being a leader? You need to get to know whether it's a patient, if you're a physician. If and by the way, you worked in a hospital before you came I to work did, for us. I did, yes. And, as and, a patient rep. And unfortunately, I saw it all too often because of the numbers and the volume of people that came into the hospital, especially through the emergency department. It is the volume of patients that the doctors and nurses need to deal with on a daily basis. Patients often become just that, another patient, another ailment. And to move quickly to the next patient, a lot of times the the human aspect of dealing with that patient is lost. What does this physician work have to do with leadership? Everything. If you want to be a great physician, if, if you want to... Do you have to be to, a physician leader? You do need to be a physician leader. I think that anyone that is a physician that has taken that time to put in the hours and hours and countless, countless, countless years to become that physician... The best. The best. They are a leader. But I'm sorry, they can't just be a doer? They cannot. Oh, I tell you. I was waiting. Yes, they I just know. Can't You've be. just been waiting. I was just waiting. It was a setup. They are not the doer. No, they're not the doer. They are the leader. However, that does not make them the automatic, hey, I'm a great communicator and I know how to talk with those Go patients. Ahead. Keep talking. Mary so, Gamma, Steve Adubato, the Leadership Hour. Go ahead. And this is where we may agree to disagree again, because as the patient, if I am laying there and I have gangrene on my foot and I just really, I don't really care if my doctor's warm and fuzzy as long as he's really smart and knows how to save oh, that Oh, come foot. on, Mary. Hold on. But how about if the chief, whatever the heck he is called, right. is walking with 15 residents and they're in the middle of a hallway and they're talking mm -hmm. about her? What does a true physician, doesn't he have to be or she have to be a great physician leader in talking to those residents oh, yes. while that woman is sitting there, laying there on the gurney? In an, in an ideal situation, yes, absolutely. We're talking about and great again, leadership, not average or crappy, or excuse me, bad leadership. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's the difference. When it comes to that situation that you just shared, the Patch Adams example, sure, in an ideal world, it's great if that physician leader, um, the chief of staff, whatever he may be, right. um, it would be great if he, could out, he or she could really connect with that patient. But unfortunately, in a hospital setting, there's not always that time to connect You think it's that time? Deeply. It you is, don't think it's inclination? and attitude oh, it is. and having empathy and compassion. It is. It is. But there's a lot of other factors. You're you're talking the difference between a physician that may literally be on his 23rd, 24th, 25th hour of being awake, treating patients. And that's when as a patient, trust me, I'd rather that he treat my my illness or my injury and not worry about treating me oh, Mary, emotionally. To, oh, my God. Oh, here we oh, go. My God. Brian, I think this may Hold be my... On. Thank you for all everyone for listening. This is my last leadership hour with Steve Adubato. <laughs> Mary, I'm gonna, we, we do a lot of physician leadership mm -hmm. training, do we not? Yes. And we have a physician leadership academy at one of the mm -hmm. largest and most significant healthcare systems in the state. And we, we do physician leadership with a lot of folks. Yes. I'm going to say this. You're on your 20th hour of mm -hmm. being a great physician, <clears throat> helping people, saving lives. <clears throat> you now walk into a room where a woman or a man with their family around them is being told that they have a serious, um, they're dealing with cancer mm -hmm. and it's at an advanced stage. And you just said that, listen, all I really want is I know you're going to give me the best surgery and give me the best care. I'm telling you that for those people, that real leadership requires something other than just the facts, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Just the facts. I'll Not date always. myself all the way back to G Joe Friday. No, on I'm Dragnet. talking. I'm talking emergency department. I'm talking in an emergent oh, okay. situation. So yeah, just to clarify. Got a broken leg. Yeah, like if I'm in pain and I've got an like an like I need to be either sewn up or bandaged up or what reset. You don't need all the touchy feely. I don't need all the touchy feely. However, to go to your situation that you just said, if a doctor is going to walk in and God forbid that tells tell me that I have stage four cancer. Of course, that doctor better have those skills and tools to hold my hand. And if he or she doesn't, 
part of being a leader is going out and getting the help that he or she the needs, training. the training, in order to empathize with because every patient is a human being. Okay, stay on this. What's the movie, Brian? Could the team research this while we're talking? There's a movie with a young guy. I think he's about 30ish, and he is told he, he runs, he works out. His best best friend in the movie is Seth Rogen, and he finds out that he has. Cancer. Oh yeah, that's uh, a has, newer movie in the last. And like, he only two has years. so many years to live. But the doctor who's telling him, and I'll get off this in a minute, literally is looking at the screen of his. What's it called? The movie's fifty fifty. Yeah, that's 50. the one. That's one hundred percent the one. Yeah. And I will tell you, watching that physician, that surgeon telling this young man, he's not even looking at him. He's looking at the screen, mm -hmm. and he goes, "What are my chances?" And he goes, "Fifty fifty." And it was all about the statistics. It was all about the treatment. He handed him a brochure, told him what he needed to do. No sense of compassion, empathy. And the guy was alone, 30-year-old guy, just alone. And I thought, a real physician leader, a real leader, mm -hmm. would have connected, shown compassion and empathy because it's required you say? We're in agreement there, All right, 100%. Oh, absolutely. And and I'm glad that you did clarify because there is a difference situational. between situational and going back to the jargon part of it. When that doctor does talk to me about whatever the ailment is, I hope he does so in easy to understand language so I can make sense of it rather than complicated words that I then need to Google when I get home and have no idea how to spell. By the way, uh, in the time we have left, why do you think so many really smart people, people trained in their field, people who um, technically very proficient, why do you think so many have such a hard time translating what they know into a fashion that others will not only understand but more importantly be willing to follow them? Oh, that's a tough one. Probably because they were not trained on how to do it. I think when you get those, and I'll call them STEM people, right? Science, Science technology, technology, engineering, engineering and math. A lot of the STEM folks are very black and white when it comes to I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning, and I'm, I've am i got my head in a book, and I'm learning the best terminology and the newest technology and how to apply all these different new techniques. So I think that the part that's missing in, instead of, say, a more liberal arts type, if you're going out there and doing a sales job, you, softer you, skills. Softer skills. You're not trained because you want to know what? You better be the best, whether you're a radiologist or if you're a, a, whatever you're doing, you better be really good at it. And oftentimes I don't think they're trained on how to be an empathetic and clear communicator. And stay on this. <clears throat> We've talked about this before on the Leadership Hour. By the way, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, uh, this is the Leadership Hour on AM 970. In just a few minutes, you could pick up the second half hour, which will be State of Affairs that I anchor. Um, we having important, prominent leaders of all stripes coming and talking about a whole range of issues. Mary, by the way, where can people check out our stuff? Absolutely. Stand-deliver.com. Uh, we have a variety of articles that you've written on all these topics, as well as on Twitter, uh, Steve Adubato, and on Facebook, Steve Adubato, PhD. And Hot Off the Press, we also have now people can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and Google Play. Uh, so here's where I'm going. So what about um, people who become super doers? The super nurse, the super surgeon, the super teacher, the super plumber, the super engineer, they're really good at what they do, the super accountant, mm -hmm. the super lawyer, litigator, he or she becomes the head of the department. They're running meetings. They're making presentations. They're having to coach and mentor people. And all of a sudden, talk about a fish out of water. In the couple minutes we have left, what's wrong with the philosophy of thinking that the super leader is naturally? The, the great teacher, of course, is going to be a great principal, right? No, because they weren't trained how to do it. They took years to refine and learn their craft. If they're on a legal team or a great lawyer, they took years to study all the different cases. Doctors, they reviewed the best procedures to do. Plumber, they learned the best way to use that PVC pipe in the plumber's putty. They can fix it. They can they fix can it. They can do it. They could do it themselves, but to lead is 
a totally different skill. And to think that you are going to naturally, some people do naturally have it, but if you don't, you need to definitely find whether it's Toastmasters or reading books or nowadays it's easy. Uh, you could Google, how can I be a great leader? And You think you can, you can Google you your can way Google into leadership? It. Really? Absolutely. Then what the heck are we doing every day if you can Google the answers? We're just here to help people every little bit that we can. But yes, but you need to learn and you, to, you need to invest the time to be a lifelong learner. I don't believe, oh, I can't believe we're doing this at the end of the leadership hour, uh, half hour, first half hour leadership hour. Mary, if you don't know what you don't know, you can't learn those things. Meaning, you can go on Google and say, what are the five keys to being a great leader? Oh my God, you need to be able to make strong, compelling presentations. You need to coach and mentor other people. You need to inspire and motivate. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the list, right? Right, but you need to start somewhere, but is you my don't point. Even, I agree, but Mary, I'm going to argue that until you do a hard self-assessment, mm -hmm. an assessment of those around you about the skills and tools, which we otherwise call a 360 evaluation. Mary Gamba asks four people who know her, what are my three greatest strengths as a potential leader? What three areas do I need to work on? And give me a concrete example of where those, not weaknesses, but mm -hmm. opportunities for growth play out. Give me, tell me exactly where, okay, I'm not doing as well as I should. Nobody does that unless they're forced to do that. We do that with our clients. So I'm saying you can't become a great leader by knowing a list of things to do. Until you have a strong sense of your strengths and the opportunities for growth, you can't grow. That's just my view. And there's 10 seconds left. I have, There's a clock behind you. That That's you like say. perfect timing. So you get the last word. So I'm just going to say that Mary Gamba has gone from being a super doer to an incredible leader because she <laughs> See, had See, it the, is possible, everyone. Yeah, in your case, but you're not normal. You're not average. You're special. And that's why I want to ask everyone to join Mary Gamba and me, Steve Adubato, every Sunday at 2 p.m. on AM 970, The Answer for the Leadership Hour. Stay tuned for State of Affairs right after this. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey LeBenger. At Summit Medical Group, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important healthcare issues that affect their lives. That's why we're very proud to support important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Summit Medical Group, Wells Fargo, the Russell Berry Foundation, Georgian Court University, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by Observer New Jersey Politics. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We are coming to you from the Agnes Ferris NJTV studio. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome for the first time Christine Norbert Beyer, who is Commissioner of New Jersey Department of Children and Families. Good to see you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. Nice meeting you. Same here. Describe your organization. So the Department of Children and Families is the you know cabinet level department. Um, we are the state agency focused on all things children. And um, so while we do have protective services, uh, formerly DIFUS, now Child Protection and Permanency, mm -hmm. we also run a number of other programs for children, for families, youth, you know, up to age 21, um, substance abuse, mental health treatment. We do a lot of prevention services. Um, so, you know, we are a lot more than protective services. Commissioner, I'm curious about this. The most pressing, difficult, perplexing problems facing our most vulnerable children. What are they? 
Uh, I think one of the challenges that you know we have in the state right now is that um, poverty is a big issue for many of the families that we serve within the Division of Child Protection and Permanency, and even in some of our other divisions. And so, you know, there are a lot of issues that happen as a result of that. Um, you know, some of that is the stress of. Of being having you know trying to make ends meet with hmm. your family and um, and so you know I would say that um, for children it's um, just wanting get the support that they need or having the support that they need from their families feeling safe having their basic needs is it met. emotional support physical nutrition issues so we're it's talking all, of, all the, of it it's all of the above yeah all of the above. It, it, and is it disproportionately, uh, the, the, the children you serve, the families you serve, are they disproportionately socioeconomically in a different place on the ladder, poor? Um, it depends on the service. You know, I think that there is a misnomer that child welfare or child protective services typically serve um, low-income families or that, you know, we serve uh, disproportionately in inner cities. Mm. And really, that's not the case. I mean, unfortunately, child abuse and neglect knows no socioeconomic bounds. Mm. Um, and so for protection and permanency, that crosses, you know, barriers. But um, I would say that in some of our other programs, some of our prevention programs, our division of community um, partnerships, you know, there's that's where we see families who are struggling financially, who are on public assistance. Um, you know, it's important for us to be able to ensure that young children get to school, um, early intervention services. And so we partner with a lot of other departments around the state to ensure that, you know, young children and families get what they need so that they're giving kids mm -hmm. a good start so they don't end up getting into our child protection system. You're listening to uh, Christine Norbert Beyer. Uh, she's the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Children and Families. This is Steve Adubato. And I'm curious about something. You talk about partnerships and collaboration. I mentioned to you before we got on the air that um, we've had Cecilia Zalkine. Cecilia was in today, uh, actually taping, right, Jackie? Um, for advocates of okay. you know, advocates for children in New Jersey. Yeah. We're having a conversation about um, infants and toddlers, zero to three, if you will, mm -hmm. an initiative we're doing called Right From the Start NJ. <clears throat> in terms of your department, what is the responsibility and role you have for protecting infants and toddlers? Is there a specific role? Um, I would say... Excuse me for interrupting, because I know it's, we have the Commissioner of Health in today. It's broken up. So, some of those responsibilities are there. Some of it may be in your area. Some of it may be in other areas of state government. It's fragmented, yeah. is it not? I don't know that I would say it's fragmented. I think it's complex. that it is complex. And I think that you know each of the state departments have a role to play. Um, and when we do it right, we work together um, in order to ensure that kids zero to three get what they need. What do they need? Um, I think that from our perspective in the, de in the Department of Children and Families, we're really looking at um, how do we support parents in that they can give their kids zero to three what they need. Some of that is ensuring that they have protective factors, that um, they send their kids to um, early intervention if necessary, um, that they get to the appropriate medical care, that kids are being seen regularly mm -hmm. by pediatricians. Mm -hmm. um, it's preventive. That, it's absolutely <clears throat> preventive. And by the way, you said this, excuse me for interrupting, Commissioner. You said we go, we're beyond child protection. Prevention is the focus. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that I struggle with and um, is something that I'm going to have to really work very hard on as the commissioner is the branding of our department. People think DC. Branding? The branding, yeah, branding of the Department of Children and Families because most people in the state believe that DCF is synonymous with protective services or DCPNP. Formerly DIFUS. A lot of um, acronyms. Yeah, uh, it's too many <laughs> acronyms. Um, but it's child protection. And so when they hear DCF, they think automatically child protection, foster care. There must adoption. be an abuse situation, and they're that's coming right. in, the state's coming in to quote unquote that's protect right. that child. Yeah, and so. And that's part of what you do. That is, and it's an important part of what we do, but it's not the only thing we do. And so that's when families are deeper into the system or after the fact. And so, you know, a lot of our focus is about how do we prevent child abuse and neglect? How do we ensure that families have what they need, that parents have the education, the supports, the programs and services 
that they need in order to be able to keep their kids safe. And um, so our focus really is going to be about prevention. And um, you know, one of the ways that states child welfare is funded in states um, traditionally has been when kids are in, in foster care. That's right. And then the federal government gives um, money to the states After to take care of those children in care. And so there really has never been a mechanism to mm. draw down dollars specifically for prevention. And that changed in February of this past year, um, of this year, what 2018. Changed? Um, there was a new federal law passed called Family First Prevention Act. And so that will give states the opportunity to draw down dollars um, for prevention services so that we can actually provide services to kids in home, to their families in home before things get to the point of, of you know, removal being necessary or before an um, imminent risk. Commissioner, let me, before I let you out, Commissioner uh, Christine Norbert Beyer, Commissioner of New Jersey, Department of Children and Families. I'm curious about this on a personal level. How'd yeah. you get into this whole thing? Why do you care so much? How did I get into this? Um, the Reader's Digest version. Um, I'm going old school on you. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? Well, I will tell you that I went to Stockton. I graduated yep. from Stockton. And you went to Rutgers as well. And I went to Rutgers with an MSW, bachelor's yes. from Stockton. We were not there the same yeah. years, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe close. Go ahead. Um, and, um, and I was a marketing major. I went to school as a marketing major, and I got a D in marketing my freshman year. What? And I decided I needed to rethink my plan. <laughs> That's what... And so as a result of that, I started taking always interested in social issues, social justice. And so I took some social work classes and I fell in love and is the, rest the rest history? is history. Sorry for yeah. doing that because they're like, you gotta go to a break. I said, I wanna know more, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you so much, yeah. we appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate Listen, it. Uh, we're right back with State of Affairs right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome Michelle Sekirka, President and CEO, New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Good to see you, Michelle. Great to be here. As usual, BIA has done an important study, in this case looking at uh, the current regional business climate in New Jersey and how we rank what? In the region, the country, what? Well, unfortunately, when it comes to regional competitiveness, we are dead last. Dead last, meaning when we track trends on um, spending, on taxes, on cost of living, uh, we rank last in the region. We did a study where we took six factors and we compared ourselves to seven states in the region, northeast, and we came in dead last. Based on, is it taxes primarily? Yes. Which ones? Uh, well, if you think about corporate business tax, if you think about individual tax, if you think about Individual property, meaning income tax? Yeah. If you think and then that, property? Oh, property tax number one. Absolutely number one. So some of these taxes were not dead last, but when you rank the six factors all together and you add them up and score them, we are last. And we're not just last, we come in 33. And the next one behind us is at like 26 when you add up the factors. Add in another piece of this. There are lots of folks across this country who believe fervently, Michelle Sikirka, that we need to increase, you know where I'm going, the minimum wage, 15 bucks an hour. I see campaigns everywhere, people saying mm. it's not a livable wage. I think that you are saying that the survey found that that $15 minimum wage in New Jersey would make us more or less competitive what? Oh, no, less competitive. So our number one out-migration state is Pennsylvania. They're not even having a discussion around raising minimum wage right now. In New York, you know, the yes, discussion Andrew is Cuomo different. Yes, Andrew Cuomo is on behalf of it. We also know what the challenge in New York is right now. It's very early on, and we already hear from our industry members, our business members who have companies in New York as well, where the challenges are. Retail, um, supermarkets, they're very challenged over there. You know, people think that, um, everybody always talks about corporate greed and corporate welfare and thinks there's all this money flowing back to companies. Let's talk about Main Street companies. Their profit margin is about yo big. All right, think about the pizzeria. Think about the bakery. Think about the laundromat. Right. When you go in, you take and expand their expenses, what do they do? It's a balance sheet. They either have to increase cost or they have to cut expense. It's very easy, right? I mean, the math's easy on this. So I want to understand something else. The income tax, and again, we are doing this program. We don't know as we do this program whether there's going to be an increase 
in the quote-unquote millionaire's tax in the state. Governor Murphy has talked about it with us many times and, more importantly, with many other media organizations, said it publicly. Um, the income tax rate in the state of New Jersey is... Well, the highest is 8.97. Yep, as we speak. Yes. In Pennsylvania, what is it? Oh, you, now you're testing me on my numbers. It's three percent. Correct. Thank you. It's three percent. Three percent. Significantly. In lower. New York, I believe. Check this out, team. As we're talking, I believe it's five-ish. And in Florida, do you happen to know? <laughs> it's zero. zero. <laughs> and why do I raise it? I'm just curious. Yeah. Doesn't matter. You, you could think taxes need to be raised or not. That's your business. How easy is it for certain people who don't like or don't want to stay in a state with a certain income tax rate? to, quote, just leave? It's, well, it's very easy. So here's our, our number one challenge, is that number one out migration state, Pennsylvania, right across the river. Bucks County, Lehigh Valley. I mean, could just go up the Delaware and see the migration that has taken place over time. Uh, I live and work in Mercer County for two decades. I have watched Bucks County grow as I've watched Mercer County not grow. Okay? Right. So you can talk about out migration to that number one state right across the river, walking with your wallet. But the other thing is you talk about Florida. Now, we can't compete with Florida. Let's be fair. No, right? you can't. We, That's zero. And we need, a prop, we need an income tax in order to pay for our public schools and a whole range of other things. And the services that we have rich services in the Great state of services. Jersey. But what we do have, and remember, you know, the sun shines all the time in Florida, warm right. weather. Mm -hmm. When people aren't, because people say, oh, they go to Florida for the weather. They're not going to Pennsylvania for the weather. So keep that in <laughs> mind, right? That's a definite walk with That's your wallet. That's fair. Okay? But what they are doing is we have the new, what I call the new snowbird phenomenon. Six months and a day outside the state of New Jersey, you're not considered a resident of New Jersey for income tax purposes. So therefore... So therefore, more people, the traditional snowbird used to be go down after Christmas, come back around Easter. Now? Six months and a day. Six months and a day outside the state of New Jersey, you're not taxed on your income in the state of New Jersey. So then you have zero income tax because you're then a Florida resident. If you're a Florida resident, absolutely <sighs> correct. Yes, so we see that. I could tell you, go to Trenton Mercer Airport on a Thursday night. You will see all the folks who can afford to do it go down to Florida counting their days for the four-day weekend. Mm -hmm. What do you say, Michelle, that was out here, what do you say to those, um, again, we don't know what's going to happen with the millionaire's tax. What do you say to those, like Governor Murphy and others, who say, you know what? We've got a pension crisis in New Jersey, a public employee pension crisis. It's underfunded. The public schools are not getting the dollars they need, um, a whole range of other services. Mm -hmm. If we do not raise taxes on the wealthiest in the state, governors often called it a fair tax, mm. we will never be able to do the things we need to do to keep services where they need to be in the state. You say? I say we need structural reform. What does that mean? That means that we need to restructure how we fund education through property tax, number one. We need to address um, how the health care benefits for state workers. Now, I'm not picking on state workers, okay, but there has been at least for five years a recommendation out there to the tune of $1.2 billion to take the health care plan from a platinum to a gold. $1.2 billion, Steve, right there at to the save making. It? To save Yes. Yeah, but Michelle, respect. That goes right back into the budget. You could put that into the pension. But didn't public employees give up a whole range of their benefits in the 2011 pension reform plan between Governor Christie and the Democratic legislature? There's, didn't they give up a lot? Oh, there's so much more opportunity for reform. There was, re there was absolutely reform at that point in time. Step one of reform. There's so much more. And you're not, you're not having a disparate impact, a disparate treatment of the state worker. Take a look in private they sector. They don't say that. Oh, my gosh. Look at private sector benefits, okay? There's no such thing as pension plans anymore in the private sector. Everybody's on a 401k, number one. Number two, look at health care. Number one issue to New Jersey business every year when we survey them, yep. rising cost of health care, rising cost with less benefit. More and more, we're having to, the businesses are having to put that on their employees to pick up more of the premium. But public employees, without belaboring this, say, we get paid less than they do in the private sector, which is why these benefits should come to us. Yeah, I, I would respectfully disagree. You know, this isn't the 1950s, 60s, 70s, okay? We have spent years making sure that state workers get competitive wages, negotiations. I was on a school board for over 10 years. I negotiated six labor contracts. I know how the process goes. People are treated fairly here. They're treated fairly. Real quick before you go. This whole question of tax reform, comprehensive tax reform, do you believe that we should lower the income tax rate? We should do everything we can to bring more relief back to residents. Michelle Sikirka who is the uh, president and CEO of New Jersey Business Industry Association. Thank you, Michelle, as always. Check out next time. Be right.
right back at, right after this. I swear I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> to see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Recently, I was on location at the Russ Berry Awards for Making a Difference. There, we met a 2018 honoree with a very special story. Here now is that conversation. My name is Melissa Gertz. I am the founder and executive director of the Community Justice Center. We are a legal services nonprofit in New Jersey. Uh, we just represented our 650th client. To quote Cornell West, justice is what love looks like in public. What has always called to me most, even as a child growing up in New Jersey, was not just a distaste for injustice, but an imperative to do whatever was in my power at that particular moment to rise above and against it. It drove me to law school and to choose Rutgers School of Law in Newark because of its legacy of inclusion and integrative approach to social justice and civil rights, that all oppressions and isms are one and the same. In the summer of 2004, in the midst of law school, I was interning at a civil rights organization in the Mississippi Delta when life decided to rudely interrupt. In short, I was T-boned by a truck and nearly died, but I didn't. Instead, after countless surgeries and rehabilitation, I was left with a face full of hardware that felt and looked like more like the inside of a piece of electronics. Extremely limited vision, and the most important and devastating of it all, traumatic brain injury, or TBI. Meanwhile, veterans have been returning from deployment with TBI. Everyone knows this, in large part because of the light cast by Bob Woodruff after his own injury while embedded. But what everyone doesn't know are the endless battles they face upon return, within themselves and to get the benefits and treatment they rightfully deserve. Without it, we all know the outcome, suicide. But we don't all quite understand why. But I did. And in New Jersey, there weren't any legal services outfits to help. The question is not why did I start the Community Justice Center, the question is how could I not? My rescue dog Kenna and I have become quite the dynamic duo. Returning veterans and others dealing with PTSD and TBI find the comfort of Kenna coupled with my personal experience compelling and are much more open about their own struggles. And the real kicker? She was rescued just a few miles from my car accident 1,300 miles away. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? I feel like this says it all. Our clients don't have the luxury of time. Homelessness or worse suicide is at their doorstep. Of course, medical and financial stability are critical, but my clients will tell you something else. Educate yourself. Thanks to the internet, you have many resources at your fingertips. Do you need a starting point? Start with the spoon theory. Surviving a near-death experience, I, I cherish what many others take for granted. Given my own limited energy reserve, I am quite choosy about how I spend my time and with whom I spend it. In moments of doubt and frustration, I often refer to this quote from my mentor, former New Jersey State Supreme Court Justice Virginia Long. You will have your chance to make a difference. The issue is whether you will take it. You can be an ordinary thread in the tunic, or you can be that royal touch of purple that gives distinction to the garment. Be that royal touch of purple to the world. I have been swimming upstream for so long that sometimes it feels like, while not small to those on the receiving end, that my contribution in the fight against this particular injustice is insignificant. I'm hopeful this recognition will open more doors, more hearts, and help save even more lives from suicide. It is my honor to introduce a young lady who is being recognized by the Rustbury um, awards for making a difference. She is Melissa Gertz, and she heads up an organization called Community Justice Center in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, Melissa, describe that organization. Uh, the Community Justice Center is a legal services outfit, the first of its kind in New Jersey, to serve disabled veterans and others that struggle with invisible illnesses, specifically traumatic brain injury and PTSD. I am a survivor of both, and so I, uh, I understand this struggle very well. Sure. By the way, I'm going to drop this, if you don't mind, because I also have, Melissa asked me 
to hold this in case you needed it. And, and let's put things in perspective. This is an iPad with some information. And you thought maybe you might need this for the interview because you said you heard about my reputation and you didn't <laughs> trust me because you're a lawyer and you're, you know, you know. you're skeptical <laughs> in a good way. But more to the point. You understand this on a personal human level. Uh, you've created this organization to make a difference for others. How and why? Well, like I said, in 2004, I was uh, T-boned by a truck and nearly died. Um, I didn't, thankfully. I survived. But with a face full of hardware, extremely limited vision, and a traumatic brain injury. Fast forward five years. the. Uh, Veterans were coming back in record numbers with TBI and PTSD and not getting the benefits that they deserved or the treatment. We all know the result of this, record number of suicides. I, on, on the other hand, knew, understood why. It's interesting, you experienced it. You've had your challenges. You have had a very successful career as an attorney. But my question is, what made you say, I want to help others while I'm struggling with my own situation? That's really what I'm curious about. And frankly, I think a lot of folks watching are. Cornell West said it best. Just the great professor of Cornell West, Dr. West. Yes. Justice is what love looks like in public. I have always had an, kind of been called and have an, an imperative to, in any particular moment, do whatever was in my power to stand up and rise, rise above and against injustice. And this, to me, was just another form of injustice. So, so interesting. The, the awards for making a difference, the Russ Berry Awards, you are being recognized. You're called a hero. Uh, honoring New Jersey's hero is, in fact, what the brand is and the tagline is. Do you consider yourself a hero? No, I don't. Uh, I, I, f I would like to put myself out of business, to be honest, because the veterans shouldn't need me. They should be getting what they deserve from the beginning. They shouldn't need us lawyers to come in and fight for them. They need to be believed. Uh, I, what do you I, mean believed? You know, uh, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, other invisible illnesses, you can't see it. If you look fine, you must be fine. I look fine, but I'm definitely not fine. Uh, that, that's part of the problem is that there's a lack of education uh, among invisible things. And like I said, it's, you're, if you're missing a limb, you can see it. If you have a brain injury, you can't see it. But it's just as chronic, it's just as lifelong, and it's just as debilitating. One more question, Melissa. First of all, congratulations on being honored. Because you look so healthy, you look so good, and the camera speaks for itself. Um, could you let folks understand how challengingly, obviously you did not need this iPad, I wanna make that clear, that was a crutch for you. Um, but how challenging is it for you so that those of us who don't see it and experience it personally can have a sense of how challenging, just frankly, just doing this interview is? It is extremely challenging. For example, right now, I'm in a ton of lighting that I shouldn't be in because it could induce seizures. I'm, I'm heavily these, these television lights. Polarescent lighting. Most people with traumatic brain injury have, issue, have severe light sensitivity. So while I'm legally blind, I have superpower, superhero night vision. I can see everything in the pitch black. But when you put fluorescent lighting or spotlights, I can't see anything. I want to say thank you. Um, you have taken the challenges that you face every day and decided to make a difference in the lives of others, particularly veterans dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome, with traumatic brain injuries, which you've experienced yourself. And um, I just wish there were more people like you in the world. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. And I hope this helps uh, open more doors and more hearts and save some more lives. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Summit Medical Group, Wells Fargo, the Russell Berry Foundation, Georgian Court University, the Turrell Fund, supporting Right from the Start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. This is absurd. Insurance fraud costs every New Jersey family over $1,300 every year. Report fraud at njinsurancefraud.org. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The sharing arc means to me hope, life, 
and everything. The sharing network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources.